So welcome back to the Defiant Spirit Podcast. I am Baruch Halevi, also known as B, and I am here today in the virtual studio with my good friend, Michael Feiner. What's happened to Michael? Not too much, B. Just back from Portugal. So looking forward to, to doing another podcast with you. Hopefully it was a uh, both productive and enjoyable trip. It was. It's a it was a good business trip, and it's a beautiful country if you ever have a chance to uh, to go to Lisbon. Um, as I guess our now longtime followers of our podcast know, we talk about everything, but especially the Enneagram, which is an ancient personality assessment system. And particularly when you and I get on the call, it's not always and it's not bound to, but around wealth, calling it Wealth 360. Um, what would Portugal be on the Enneagram? It, it, it's funny that you say that. I mean, in a certain sense, it reminded me a bit, um, a little bit like Italy, but mm. not quite as maybe gregarious as, mm. as Italy. So I don't know, maybe a seven or um, maybe a two. They were very kind, nice people, helpful, stuff like that. So yeah. I've never been. Yeah, I mean, surrounded by Spain, so it it was very refreshing. Very great people, beautiful country. Yeah, I've heard good things. Uh, I know Italy's a um, Enneagram two, I guess is what is most people two? would say. Yeah, you know, very warm, nurturing. That's the helper yeah. for anybody. I'd say then two probably. That's probably that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that sounds sounds right. Um, I'll just put this up for people. We want to see the Enneagram, don't always know what we're talking about. So yeah, we're talking about the Enneagram today, and we're going to focus not on uh, the Portuguese people or Ital Italians. We're going to focus on Enneagram 1. For anybody listening, um, well, actually, if, I guess that's everybody, if you're listening. Um, my last podcast, well, Michael was basking in the sun in Portugal. I was at home in the virtual studio working hard on our behalf to set this conversation up. Michael, I talked about the Enneagram one, the reformer, the perfectionist. And so if you are just joining us and we're talking more from the lens of wealth 360, since that's Michael's expertise, um, you can go back and listen to the other podcast where I cover kind of the nuts and bolts of the Enneagram one, the perfectionist, the reformer, so anything you want to know about the one, you can go back there. And we're just going to kind of pick up where one meets life, meets uh, your experience, Michael, of the world, and especially seen through the lens of finance. So how about we start with um, maybe you give us an overview of what we're calling the one from a financial perspective and why? Yeah, well, I think as we discussed before, the one tends to be someone... I look at as somewhat of a perfectionist or, an, or as you've taught me more of an Id idyllic personality or th like the ideal. Yeah. Um, and in sort of like a very neat look at the world, they like things neat and orderly, linear, organized. That's a fair statement. Um, and then that results in a different strategy, I imagine, for the way they approach their finances, their wealth, and the way you would approach them, right? That's the whole point of our bringing the Enneagram into the conversation. Well, what you've taught me about all this, and I think it's very poignant, is, you know, based on, on your personality, based on, on your natural instincts, you have certain tendencies and, and things need to be customized, both for communication and how one would invest based on your tendencies. And I think that's why this is so important. And that's the breakthrough that you have done with, with this system as it relates to wealth is customizing it for specific circumstances. It's not going to be a boilerplate. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. We're taking sort of the client and putting ourselves into their shoes to experience the world, which is the beauty of the Enneagram. You know, some people will say to me, well, okay, it's another self-development tool. Not exactly because yeah, I, do think of their self-development, but it's a relationship tool because now I can navigate based on your roadmap, not my roadmap. And if you're a one, that looks very different than the eight, the challenger. And so I can put myself into your shoes. I can experience wealth through your lens and we can create an investment strategy based on your needs. Right. And so that's a beautiful, I think, uh, 
way to treat clients as, as, as human beings, as people who are unique. I think this gives you the ability to speak in a language that is based on the client's history and perspective, framework, attitudes, where they come from, where they've been, where they're going versus a one size fits all. Right. That's right. One size fits all. It's gone. It never worked. You know, I just got back from Starbucks. Uh, it's my daily outing to Starbucks, which I wish I had stock. Do I have stock in Starbucks? No, not in Starbucks, but it, it, it's funny that someone was pushing Starbucks on CNBC today. So it's all over the place, but you know, you're right. Selling you a $5 cup of coffee versus a dollar cup of coffee. I mean, how do they do that? Well, they do it because they see you. They see your, they, they honor your choice. You know, my daughter was with me and she ordered like some, I, I can't even recreate her thing, but no foam and extra hot and this Splenda and that did. And they looked at her like she's normal. I mean, imagine ordering that like 20, 30 years ago at the local diner, right? They look at you, they, yeah. they throw you out. I was trying to remove a pickle once from McDonald's off the burger, right? I mean, it's <laughs> okay. like sacrilegious. So, um, so this is the Starbucks. This is to to personality and you know, kind of treating people. What Starbucks is the coffee, which is to see people on their terms and you know the uniqueness of every cup. So, anyways, um, our Enneagram One is built around some core values. So I'm gonna I'm gonna actually share. This is my yeah. first time publicly sharing some of this picture, but I'm going to share with you a picture here. And this is from my program, um, Defy Your Number and the Wealth 360 program. And on this um, slide, if, if those of you are looking, those of you who are listening, we'll just describe it to you, are some core values. But I, I like the name that we've given the one. Why, why are we calling the one the blue chip investor? You're the expert. Well, the blue chip investor is synonymous with buying stable, strong companies that have strong history, strong cash flows. It's min trying to minimize risk while maximizing, you know, future opportunity. They tend to reflect the strongest companies and, and so forth. So I think that's why when we think of the one who is sort of a blue chip person, core, it, they tend to have you know, core values and, and so forth. Yeah. One, Enneagram ones are known for very, being very principle driven. Um, of course, everybody has principles and values and we all want to live by them, but for ones, it's a, um, it's a, it's just a, it's a core need. And when they're out of sorts with their principles, there's, there's this, um, uh, tension with a one I see with my son, you know, when he's, he's right now, he's probably not thrilled with me saying this, but he's uh, in college. So he's not in his highest one self place, you know, frat boy kind of a stuff. And it's taking its toll on him because on the one hand, he's got all these ideals and principles and values. And on the other hand, he's living a frat boy college life and you can feel it's wearing him down. And I see this with ones who just aren't in alignment with their values so I guess that would translate into companies and investments that really reflect those values. Well, like you said, ones have a definite set of rules to their lives, mm -hmm. probably a long list of principles, of rules, of they live by the rule book, whatever the rule book may be. And so do these stocks that are blue chip stocks or that are companies, right? They're very identifiable. They're very concrete, secure, historical, generally. They're the salt of the earth type of companies. So that that understandable for someone who who is very principled or rule oriented. Now it doesn't mean that they're perfect. You know, every there's no better or worse Enneagram type. There's just different challenges, different strategies. So as an example, um, Martha Stewart is a one, right? Tell us, tell us about Martha Stewart from a financial perspective, your opinion. Well, obviously, Martha Stewart is perfect in, in that sense. She, she, everything is perfect about Martha Stewart. She cooks well. She looks great. She built a business. She invests in companies. She has Snoop Dogg as her best friend at this point. But when you, when you look at her, she's the quintessential 
Um, aside from her probably little detour of, of some insider trading, which a prison, yeah, a prison that got her in, in, in trouble, which is probably an aberration for, for a one. She, if you were to list, you know, who you might admire the most or want to be like, um, she might be the quintessential person that, that you look at as, as an ideal lifestyle or an ideal, um, person. Yeah. I mean, she, and, and not only that, she's passionate. She's built a business on helping other people try and create those systems, replicate oh. it. Amazingly. I think she's probably a billionaire and doing it off of cooking and, you DIY. know, dishes and DIY and, you know, buying the right curtains and, and, and all of those types of things. But I think most importantly, if you think of Martha Stewart, um, there's a definiteness about her, right? She quality. She's looking at very high quality. I think of Martha Stewart. I think of, yeah, isn't it? Everything she's doing is the best. It's mm -hmm. really high quality. And that's why the blue chip stock comes to mind because those tend to be the highest quality companies in the, in the foundation architecture and strength. Yeah. And there's a, there's this conservative nature to ones, not, you know, not political. It's just, they're, they're conservative. I think of them um, ones and sometimes like cats, right? Cats are very conservative compared to dogs, yeah. right? They conserve their energy. Yeah. They're, you know, they're harder to kind of penetrate dog, you know, like Apollo, your dog, right? He's just, what you see is what you get. Oh, absolutely. And you get a lot. You might get him any minute here, so we'll, we'll see. <laughs> and, and your three-piece suit, you know, leaves with hair and slobber, but you you were loved. That's more two-ish. That's more other. But one-ish is much more pristine, measured, calculated, which is why sometimes I have a hard time typing ones and fives. Five's the investigator. One's the um, reformer. There's a similar vibe that both have. And there's a couple times where I have a hard time typing is this person like, Here's a, let's, let's talk about another one. Um, Elon Musk. So is he a one? Is he a five? I have seen made cases made for both. I make the case that he's a one. I think he's a one, but he's got this reserved nature about him. Same with Warren Buffett. Most people argue he's a five and I do think he's a five, but there's a conservativeness to the, all these kind of um, one and five types. Well, I think from a financial perspective, Warren Buffett's a certainly a one he's the ultimate name the companies he buys he his top five holdings include things like coca-cola bank of america apple computer blue chip stocks right the big solid companies he's not invested in, in anything unique cryptocurrency stuff like that right so you know for sure blue chip right um discipline you know ones are disciplined because they're, they're into systems. They're into structure. Yeah. I, I would say systematic is a great word for what ones are. They like to be systematic about what they do, especially investing. They want to know the information, how you're going to execute it, what that means, some of the details, and, right. and how that they, – they'd be interested in the mechanics a little bit of, well, if a company makes money, how does that affect the stock price? So, and so how, should I, how should I invest? So I'm sure that translates too to your clients. Um, ones are going to want to know more detail than your average type. Is that is that your experience? I, I, I think so. And they they would want to know, you know, if you're investing money over what time period are you going to do it? What different sectors might you do it in? Would you buy stocks and bonds? They'd be in, interested in some of the details versus some of the, you know, other parts. And from an opposite you know, point of view, they don't necessarily want to invest in things that are um, really outliers or you taking a, a swing for the fences. So that's the discipline. And I'm, I'm sorry if you can hear stuff in the background. I got some uh, construction going on, but um, that's that's the discipline piece. You know, they're they're long game players. I mean, Buffett's known for not wanting to right go with. You know, he's not going to be a Robin Hood kind of investor. Right. What's the, what's the uh, what's the stock du jour? That's the opposite of his strategy. Yeah, that's right. Which might be if you're a seven or other type of thing, you might be interested, but you'll never get them to invest in the stock du jour. And you taught me that. You know, I'm not a one, and I mean, I, I tend towards one-ish things, but you you taught me this um, to zoom out. 
you know, we, we touched on it in a previous podcast that I don't think ever went public. So it's worth talking about. Um, when I hit, the, when we hit the market two years ago at the beginning of COVID and everybody's freaking out and I was on board just like everybody else. Um, and I remember you sent me a slide of the market over the past, I don't know, hundred years or 80 years or whatever, 70 years. And it was a, a 45 degree, basically angle trajectory where if you zoom out, you don't, you see the big picture and the big picture is the market is ascending. It's growing. Even if we hit these bumps and these rocks along the way, I think of that as a very one-ish approach. I think it's the ultimate one approach to understand from alpha to omega, for lack of a better analogy. If you look at it from A to Z beginning to end, you'll see what the equation is, what the sausage looks like in between you know, other people tend to focus on more. So are you able to zoom out, which is a critical skill set in investing and in life? You can't zoom out. It can be a very, very rough ride. It's probably true of you're the expert in more, you know, um, logotherapy and other counseling. But I have to suspect that that is probably a skill set that can be helpful in, in, in general. Well, that that's also so every you know type has a, both a blessing and a curse, a light and a dark. And the shadow side of the one, I see it with my son and, uh, and a couple of my clients actually who are ones, is they zoom in, they over zoom, they forget to zoom out. Because if you're if you're detail oriented, right, you're detail oriented, and you start looking at all the eyes that aren't dotted and all the T's that aren't crossed, you can drive yourself crazy. And so zooming out is such a important reminder for a one because they are long game people, but they can sometimes over zoom in. I think that's a, a great way to, to put it. And, you know, with the markets, as an example, in such a, a volatile state, probably some of the most volatile markets we've had in generation, it can be hard for some ones if, if they're zooming in one right now to understand it because it's happening so quickly. And sometimes it's incomprehensible because it's not, ones tend, I think tend to be logical, would I be right in their approaches? And sometimes the markets are not logical in the short run. To your point on the zoom out, they're logical. They correlate with earnings of companies. In the short run, they don't. You know, you could have a, you could have, a, you know, they, they, they spotted a herd of elephants in the street of Wall Street and the market fell. And someone's attributing it to that. Of course, there's nothing to do with anything. But anything can, can disrupt the market in the short run. Right. And ones, you know, ones look like fives in that way. They, it's Except for fives, the investigator, it's coming from a need to understand. For ones, it's coming from a need to be in control. Eight, right. nine, and one are the body types, and it's all really revolves around control. And that's I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because in in tough times, or tough markets like this, where I'll say it's volatile, there's no one no one is quite as stressed out when the market's going crazy on the upside. Yes, it's volatile, but in the downside, where you feel like you have to be in control, this is something that you can't be in control with in, in the short run. In fact, you cannot affect it at all as an individual investor, even as a company, or and no one can control it. And the core fear, each type has its core fear. And, and the core fear of a one is I'm not perfect. I need to be perfect. There's this chatter that happens inside a one more inside lots of types, but especially a one. And again, I see it with my son, but I see it with my clients. Um, they're just, they want to be so responsible so that if, if there's a downturn, like I invested in a particular stock and it's now plummeted and I talked to you a while back and you said, B, let's pull some of it out. And I said, Michael, no, and I should have listened to Michael Feiner, but I didn't. And if I was a one, I would really be beating myself up. I, that was not a responsible decision. You know, what you would probably, I think, have said to me is, be like, your retrospect is, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, And we didn't pull it out for whatever reason. But a one just keeps beating themselves up over and replays it over and over. I shouldn't have. I let my family down. I let my grandchildren down, right? Future generations won't getting this wealth. So you can hear how one can almost crush themselves under their pressure of responsibility. No, I see it all the time. A one will measure themselves financially from the high point of the market. They probably could tell me the date that the market hit a high point in <laughs> January of 2022. Right. Your account was at a top and now it's not. 
And why didn't they sell at that exact moment? Like, well, no one even, you know, it's impossible. Even Warren Buffett, he can't pick the highs and the lows. But in their minds, they've set that as the high watermark, as the high goal, as the, you know, the high jump, it, it, their peak moment. And why is the number not there at this point? Which yeah. can be a bit debilitating because that was one close on one day at one point in time. It will get back there at some point. My only problem, of course, is I don't know exactly when. I wish that's 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 what I need to know. But but you know that gets to the heart of what a one really has to work on is um, perfection. It was Voltaire. Somebody said per perfection is the enemy of the good, right? Because mm -hmm. if you wait for perfect, if I'm if I'm you know in your neck of the woods in Salem, Massachusetts, and I'm sitting at uh, Vinon Square for all those locals listening, and mm -hmm. I'm 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 not going to go until every light down Humphrey Street turns green, then I'm just going to be sitting there forever. I got to take the light as it comes and then go to a red and know it's not perfect, but that's how you drive. Well, that's how a one needs to learn to live of. It's not going to be perfect. So we're going to have to take good and good's going to have to be enough. That's the work. It is work. And I, I think knowing it, that you have a one, which is why this is so valuable of a system. If you know that you're a one and we know that you're a one, we can work through these changes in in life in the market because what can you do if you're one and you're looking at making a high watermark or or you know you had a stock that maybe you could have sold and now you regret well maybe it's time to buy more of that stock if it still has fundamentals it, it, it may be hurt unnecessarily it may be hurt because of nothing to do with the company for certain industries that are getting hurt that have to do with the market and not with their cash flow, their businesses. So for one, you'd say, well, how do we like to get above that high water mark by being smart now? And a one will respond to that. They will. One of the reasons why I think Warren Buffett is a five, an investigator, not a one, a reformer, is because you just touched on it. See, there's an anger with ones, eights, nines, and ones, because that body triad, that mm -hmm. gut instinct, there's a fire. Ones don't look fiery. They, they repress their fire, their anger, their intensity. Eights express it. So you know when you're with an eight, because like me, you just kind of feel that intensity. Nines, the peacemaker, they're, they're not good with it. They go away from it. But ones repress it. And you've, you can feel when you're with a repressed one that's really pushing oh. down the anger. And they explode sometimes. Fives don't. Fives are much more like even keeled. And I think of the difference between Martha Stewart and Elon Musk versus Warren Buffett. Because I just watched a documentary on Elon Musk, and he is, I think, a one, because he's very intense. Oh. Like he goes ballistic sometimes. Oh no, he, he, he can, he's just his tweets alone. Right. Warren Buffett Literally, doesn't do his tweets. They, they hate his tweets, so he bought Twitter. I mean, that's that's about as uh, aggressive as you get. Right. There's an aggressive. He, you know, he buys Twitter. He's, after, after the SEC criticizes him for tweeting stuff on the companies. He buys the company. I mean, that's pretty, I, I wouldn't call that, you know, sort of five-ish, right? Yeah, that's a that's a one-ish rebellion, you know, but mm. ones are almost, um, they're like, you know, they're, they're not like making a big stink about it. He just bought it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, there was a lot of stink in the air, but, you know, I'm just going to buy it. Like I'm done I here. And right. so fives would just more of a withdrawing type. Um, so, I, but Elon Musk and Martha Stewart, I've heard Martha Stewart's very fiery. I don't have much knowledge about her, but there's this anger underneath and you can almost feel the perfectionism, like a squeezed fist, like the, you know, the steam is going to come out their ears. So I, I, why do I say that? Because there's a volatility in a one that they need to really look at and deal with, and it can be overwhelming and sort of shut them down or make them react. Um, and I think that you are necessary for a blue chip one to really help kind of re be a release valve for some of that steam. Very interesting point, especially as you mentioned, the eight, nine ones are the body types, right? Mm -hmm. so, so I guess that's important to really understand as well, to, to understand that they do have this physical part of their personality, which could partially be repressed or which has to be addressed. And what are the techniques? What are the techniques to help them address that repressed? Because I, I know I know you're an eight, and I have friends that are eight, and you're an eight. 
So I understand a little more on an eight because they're more expressive, but how do you do the opposite when someone is a one investor and needs help with that so they don't get frustrated or, or worse? So um, let's deal, let's leave nines out for another time. So eights and ones are almost yin and yang. Eights over express. So again, when we say body, we mean like take action and it isn't always conscious. That's why instinct is what it is. It's just like this need to take action, to take control because right. we're coming back to control. Ones, um, they get caught in analysis paralysis too. You know, I see it with my son, too many choices. It causes him like this, uh, and he doesn't know which way to go. And so what eights need to do is slow down, take a deep breath, get back into your body, right? ready, aim, fire is a healthy way to go about it. Not ready, fire, aim. And ones need to get out of perfection. You're not going to make the perfect decision. We got to make the best decision. You know, so your job is to help them get back into a realistic frame of reference. And there's going to be a downside to our choice, but that's okay. All life is about downside. And, and then it's also about taking action because they'll get caught in this perfect thing and then they won't want to make a decision. And so part of a financial planner's role is to help them pull the trigger when you have enough information because you're never going to have all the information, right? And then that the market's going to pass you by by the time that happens. So make a decision as part of how you help a one get out of that paralysis. That's great advice. And that's why we're doing this is to understand how to best deliver information, how to have the best experience and, and understand each other. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to go through all the Enneagram types over the coming weeks, and we're going to look at high level, the name of the find the wealth 360 version of the Enneagram, like today, the blue chip investor. And then I think we'll do part two after we've gone through all of them, which is a deeper dive because um, Michael and I are looking at my wealth 360 program and on it, we have investment strategies and earning and spending, you know, that's more inside baseball. So we'll, put a uh, pin in that and we'll come back to the deeper strategies for investing and saving and all that kind of stuff. But how about we end with on each of these that we do as an overview, some one ish companies. So maybe they're not ones, but they certainly feel like one is ones. They, they maybe they've been started by ones or at least they have the, um, I don't know, the flavor of a one. What are, what are some that you would throw out there? Well, I, uh... The first one that you gave me, I'll never forget it. And I think it, I have to give this the number one one, right? Number one of all ones. The country is a one. I was just there. The company is definitely a one. The product they make is a one. So Rolex. Rolex. I mean, it's from Switzerland, which I think has to be a one. Yeah, for sure. Country. Rolex from a quality perspective, from a blue chip from quality, it makes precision clocks and timepieces, for God's sake, right? Right. I mean, I could if you had to say build a one company, what would it be? I think you'd have to go with Rolex. It to me, I don't have to know anything else about what you put, but when you identified Rolex as a one company, that tells me everything that I need to know. And the the one a one investor thinks would like to have a Rolex because they it's not just that it's expensive, it's not because it's an image thing or flashy, it's because they perceive it as precise, high quality. Mm -hmm. um, everything that's orderly and good about the world uh, and the highest idealism. So that's that's all I'll ever say about it. I, I, the other companies you've given, I think, are more uh, futuristic and, and uh, make a ton of sense, too. But I, I'm giving that the top of the list. All right. Well, that's a great one. And also, you know, here's a few other things. Um, ones are present focused, even though they're long, they're in it for longevity, like Rolex has been around forever. They're really present focused because present moment is where all the details are. And there's plenty of details. And so think about what, what does Rolex make? A timepiece, right? It's about now. There is no future when you're talking about now uh, time. It's now, 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 now. So there's this one-ish component to it. And, and in paying attention to all the details 
So I think you just nailed it with Rolex. Um, also, ones tend to be frugal, not cheap, but frugal. But when they invest in something, they want quality. So you just see the Rolex on somebody's wrist and a one might buy that because it's worth the investment, I imagine. So that's a... You're right. They see it's they want value in what they buy. They don't mind paying, but it has to be the highest quality for the dollar. So that's Michael's one company. And I'll end, we'll have a, every time we'll make our case for a, a one company. I'm going to throw two of them together because they're the same founder. And because Elon Musk is a one, in my opinion, and it sounds like Michael's uh, signing off on that, um, SpaceX and Tesla, both to me are one companies. They can, you can make the case that they're seven uh, futuristic, um, maybe eight because they're like um, revolutionary. But to me, they're both one because they seem to be like Elon Musk, like him or hate him principle driven and you may not like his principles but he likes his principles and he's following those principles even and especially when they come up uh against others and now i guess you could add to it twitter though twitter doesn't strike me as one but you know the world says it can't be done i watched the spacex um documentary they were they shut down the entire space program and he came along with an idealism and basically opened it back up from the private sector side, and he had to hold tight to his ideals through all kinds of turbulence. Mm. Brilliant. I think I never looked at it that way, but you're right. Tesla's about the environment and electric cars and SpaceX about why are we not at Mars and space and harnessing. It's really not about the revolutionary parts of the company. And I'm reading a book, ironically, about Nikola Tesla himself. Mm -hmm. And talk about a guy who basically invented alternating current, uh, I mean, almost everything in the future, but shared all his patents and didn't care about the money. And he, I have to believe he's a one as well, Tesla himself. I've also read he's a five. So one and five, back to this, you okay. know. So, yeah. But yeah, it's but the same. Say, he had principles that he wanted to make the world better uh, with electricity and share it and um, wasn't didn't care about getting compensated but he died a poor man yeah and that's that's a very five-ish thing so we're going to continue to uh, explore nikola tesla but um tesla as a brand it's also about like the rolex thing you know there's there were many um there still are many electric cars nobody's excited to buy most electric cars because most electric cars aren't like the gold standard right i think a lot of people my i'd guess most of the people driving teslas are driving them because they're so they're, they're they're the Rolex of the electric car world, not just because they want to save the environment. I don't even know if they do save the environment yet, but they're certainly yeah. awesome cars. True, I think you put Starbucks. Is Starbucks a one? I um, it, it's, I don't know what Starbucks is, but the idea though that the the quality piece of it is that they want the highest quality. They're systematic. I don't know. Yeah, other, but. It reminds me of a uh, um, this quality piece of it. The one seemed to be the most interested in high quality. No doubt about it. It's all about precision and quality, and yeah. so um, that's a good one. I don't. Why haven't I played Starbucks yet? I don't know where it goes. We'll have to no, figure that I, out. I don't. You know, like you said, things fit into different categories. But the idea that they're seeking the highest quality experience, mm -hmm. the highest quality coffee, is one ish. As yes. all the companies that you've mentioned, they have that character of why you're willing to pay. And it's probably $6 for the McDonald's $1 cup of coffee. That's right. It's amazing yeah. that the perception of that experience and quality can can make a business from a commodity. But, you know, they're, they're like, for instance, Enneagram 4, and then we'll wrap up here, is the individualist. And they're the, the artist. So artists can make quality too. But one of the differences is one wants to replicate. Right. They want system because one of the great things about like Tesla and this was the early you know question of whether or not he could pull this off. Can you systematize Tesla? Can you replicate it? Can you compete with um, Ford, you know, on that level? And everybody, the, they, you know, nobody believed that um, that he could pull it off. But he's a one. Right. And I think in some ways he has or at least he's on en route to doing that. 
no, remarkably, he's pulled it off. Yeah. And so Ford it's... wishes they, he, they, they could pull it off as well as he pulled it off. Yeah. So it's quality right. meets systems. And that's where I think yeah. partially we're testing. That's what they're trying to do with SpaceX, right? Can you replicate this and make it affordable? Not just can you get to the moon or wherever, Mars. Well, I like so, that. I, the replication, the systemization, the... Uh, I, I like, I'm going to write, I'm writing that part down on systemization. We don't have to, cause it's in the well 360 program. Yes. It is, but I want to, <laughs> I, I like to take a nugget every time I talk to you. Cause you always, now that you've related it to these companies, it, a picture is worth a thousand words. And that's why you've done such a great job with this Thank you. because I, I read it. And then even looking at it, I've seen this before several times, but now seeing it again, it just, really hits me with the system part of it. It's not just about the quality, it's about the system. And, and that's, that is, it's profound. It, it really well, is profound. It's, it's profound because if you're working with a one now and you know, like a four can create quality, but it, they're more individual focused. Ones are here to serve. But they're thinking generational. They're thinking about their children, their children's children. They're thinking about environmental impact. They're thinking about responsibility. Stewardship is a big word for ones that almost maybe sixes would use. Nobody else is going to call themselves a steward. It's kind of an old fashioned word. But so, yeah, it's going to affect their investment strategy. That's stewardship of a one. So. Well, you're you're. You're on to something big here, B, because this is very, very important. You've, you're, you're, you're cracking something new, just like Tesla. Uh, you didn't invent the car. You didn't invent the electric car. You, you, but the way you have crafted this operation is important, profound. It, it's amazing. Well, Elon Musk has no idea about how rockets work and getting to Mars, but he surrounded himself with people who did. And that's how I feel about you and uh, all the Wealth360 conversations. So thanks for getting us to Mars. We're on our way. <laughs> We're on our way. Um, sounds good. We're going to keep going. We're going to uh, jump into um, the other Enneagram types, both from the fundamentals, which you know, you'll get on a podcast with me, and then we'll bring Luke Michael in to uh, continue the conversation through the lens of wealth. If you want to get a hold of Michael and really start to understand your wealth, um, not just invest it, though there will be a good ROI, but um, to understand why you feel this way and how you can best reflect that in your investment strategies, uh, get a hold of Michael at finer.com, just F-I-N-E-R.com. If you want to learn more about the Enneagram, you can jump over to Defiant Spirit. Org. And until the next time, thank you, Michael. We'll keep defying our number and live in our spirit. See you next time.